So, we are having our show and tell, hints and kinks. So, uh, why don't we start with Professor Mike. Uh, this is from about 1909. It's a gray telephone, it's a pay station, pre-dial phone. I know a number of, number of you collect phones, and I know Harry's uh, sort of ex-Bell uh, Labs. I guess some of the others of you might be too. Um, so this one I particularly like. Um, this was, uh, so Gray, this is Elisha Gray. So you know, he was in competition with Alexander Graham Bell. And uh, Western Electric started out as Gray and Barton. Uh, and it was, uh, so there's a whole story associated with it. So he was, uh, he was into telephones and he was into telegraph equipment. And uh, this is, uh, the company eventually moved to Hartford, Connecticut. And what I like about this one See if I can get the, the the cash drawer open here. So it's uh, what it says on the front here. It says directions, call central office uh, as usual. Do not deposit money until told by operator. And the reason for that is that uh, the way these things worked is you would deposit a coin. Here's a nickel, and you hear a ding. And then you deposit a dime. What happens? Okay. And then you deposit a quarter. No, it's a gong. And what's cool about this, I like mechanical solutions, is how they do the two rings. So let's see if I can open this up. It kind of, might be hard to show you, but I can describe this. I think this pulls off. Um, let me just describe it. So there's a chute for the, so there's a bell. Right. And the, uh, the nickel goes down and bounces off of it and drops into the slot. Right. The dime, however, this, it, it hits one side of the bell, then there's a channel that hits a second time. So it actually it ricochets off the bell. And then there's a gong on the side here, which is just a coiled up piece of steel that allows one to, you know, to hear the gong. So in any case, I, I like mechanical solutions, and I just thought this was just really cool. So that was one, one item that I brought. And the, the operator the, would sit there and count up the things until... And the, uh, yes, the operator would know how much you've deposited by listening to it. And then if you were, uh, if you were not honest, I guess you could sort of have a, a second bell you know, outside of it and just and hit your bell and get free telephone calls. We used to use a cassette player for that purpose. But is there anything in there that stops you from putting a dime in the quarter slot? Uh, no. So you could put a dime in the quarter slot. But I don't think that the, the uh, gong sounds so well. Yeah. So that's one item. So this is a... Um, this is uh, signed by uh, Charles Clark. Uh, so Charles Clark was uh, Thomas Edison's chief engineer uh, in 1882 with the, uh, the Pearl Street power plant. So this was the jumbo dynamos. So after Pearl Street was successful, he left Edison's employee. And then, uh, so Charles Clark was a graduate of Bowdoin College. So the uh, Bowdoin College in, in Maine, they have all of his papers. And I've gone to Bowdoin to try to find uh, information about this particular device. Uh, he, uh, when he left Edison, he became, uh, he he became a patent expert, and he did a lot of testifying in electrical cases. And I believe that this was put together as a demonstration for his patent cases. And what it is, um, it's a very interesting, it's a dynamo, um, but it, it's unlike your standard dynamo, so it has the split ring commutator, so uh, you can uh, use it as a dynamo and have it self-excited. There's a set of coils. Uh, by the way, I have an Edison fan. The coils are just like the Edison fan. The armature's wound the same way, with the same kind of wire, uh, as, as well as the field coils. So you can use it to self-excite. I've gotten it running as for self-exciting. Uh, but you can also set it up. You can run a separate current in it. You can turn it into a motor using the split ring commutator. But it also has uh, slip rings so that allows you to, as you're running the commutator, you can also look at the, at the voltage in the coils. 
So if you're trying to explain how a generator works or how a dynamo works uh, or how a motor works, it's a, it's a great little device. And as I said, he signed it on the bottom. So this was, uh, this was pretty cool. Okay, so those are two items. From, yeah, this, yes, this was 1899. I think it says it right on it. Let's see. I got that from yeah, that's, by the way, that's an oil thing. It's date, yeah, it's dated on the bottom. Actually, Dave, if you want to get a close picture of this, maybe you can do this later. It says Charles Clark, 1899, uh, on the bottom. And then I have, uh, he had a collection of patents. So I tried tracking it down, as I said. I couldn't find a specific patent for this particular device. But I did find his... Uh, his records of his uh, working as a patent attorney. And this period of time was when he was doing his patent work. I got it from Roger. Yeah. So, and Roger's not cheap. But it wasn't too bad. So that was, uh, you know, I like Edison things. And then, as I said, I had to do a little rest restoration on it to get the slip rings going. But I've uh, tested it out. It works just fine. I haven't set it up as a motor, but I did have it working as a self-excited dynamo. So I don't know if you know about uh, dynamos. So, uh, you know, a, a DC generator, you have field coils. So you have, F I'm sorry, you have f uh, magnetic uh, pole pieces. So you have a permanent magnet. Uh, and then you'd spin an armature in that. In a dynamo, what happens is you have the, the, uh, the remnants of the magnetic field in the armature. The armature's made out of steel. Okay? It has enough magnetic uh, 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 induction such that when you spin it around a coil, you generate a voltage and it self-excites. So the faster you spin it, the, uh, the greater it uh, runs. And it allows you to basically extract more energy than you could get if you had a, a permanent uh, magnet. Uh, field coil. Yes. They used a lot of devices like that as demonstrators in the early day of teaching electronics. Mm -hmm. The slip rings and the commutators. Yep. Self-exciting and whatnot. Um, I wrote a few articles on and theoretics demystified about that particular thing about the dynamos and self-exciting. And mm -hmm. I find it very interesting. Oh yeah, it's it's great. And a lot of the Odell's books from the early twenties are really uh, interesting with that kind of stuff. I haven't looked in Odell's, but I know Senko. Uh, so I have early Senko catalogs. Um, so that is, I was telling you that I had to return that book to Mike Molnar. Uh, I have a, I have Mike's uh, uh, copy of his Senko catalog. They have uh, they have these uh, dynamos in them. But it's, uh, and you're right, it's actually the early electrical instruments, it was a great way to teach uh, science. And uh, some of the devices, I still use them in some of my teaching. Uh, there's a device, a tangent galvanometer. It's a great way to learn about vectors. It's a, it's a, a device that, it's, a, it's an ammeter. Uh, and it's, it has a lot of science associated with it. And today, if you give a kid an ammeter, right, it's a digital display, they have no, it's magic. Right, whereas the old galvanometers, uh, they're great. You can sort of learn trigonometry from it. So, uh, so the, they're called tangent galvanometers because the, uh, it, you, have a, you put a magnetic uh, a mariner's compass in the middle of a coil of wire. You line it up with the Earth's field. And so the current going through it will rotate the, the needle. And so you get the vector sum of the Earth's field and the field due to the current going in the coil. So it, it's the angle, the tangent of the angle is proportional to the current. So that's you know, one, one thing. You actually can see this thing operate. Uh, so it's a great way to teach about vectors and teach about trigonometry. So a, a lot of the early instruments are, are terrific, I think. Okay, so that's it for me. I saw this, uh, this little thing here. It's a, um, it's a drink coaster. And it, uh, it, store, it stores on this little, uh, uh, little holder here, which is designed to look like a, uh, a phonograph. And it actually has grooves molded into the, uh, into the record on both sides. And um, I held out hopes that maybe they were smart enough to put an Easter egg in here and that there was actually some, something uh, recorded in there, but it's not. It's just a, it's just a groove. But they did... Uh, well, that's what I was going to say. They, uh, they did put a little bit of effort into, uh, into the labels. You can come up and uh, check them out. Apparently, they, um, they may have been worried about um, uh, copyright issues because they, um, uh, they came up with uh, Protect the Surface by the Nostalgics, uh, Cover and Protect, 
no marks on the table. Uh, tea time, don't spill this. But, but this, these ones over here were actually sort of... This one here, if you can look, it has a, a logo on it that looks almost familiar, but not quite. And uh, it says, uh, hey, June. <laughs> and uh, this one here, again, looks vaguely familiar, but, but not quite right. And it says, uh, 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 bananas has made me loving you. Um, the littlest baby boy. Again, vaguely familiar looking, but uh, no cigar. Uh, this one is the Rolling Tones singing Yellow Sugar. <laughs> they put a lot of work into this. It's, uh, it's uh, kind of stupid, but they put a lot of work into it. And here is uh, uh, Mad Shiny Head, uh, Smile on the Water. So, and a few other things. Anyway, so I, I just thought that that was just utterly charming, and I had to get that. And in any case, I'm trying my, my, uh, I told my doctor, my doctor asked me, you know, when you go see the doctor, they always say, you know, well, you, do, you, do you drink? Do you drink socially? And I said, not nearly enough. I really have to up my game. So I got some coasters there to put under my drinks. And uh, to put my drinks and my coasters on, I got this uh, tray table here, which... Um, is uh, yeah apparently uh, apparently they used to use this for something back in the old days besides a tray table surface uh, I'm not sure what but um, it, it lo again it, and it looks close but no cigar um, so it's uh, it was a valiant effort by somebody over in China to uh, to to accurately portray something that didn't turn out quite as accurate as they had hoped anyway so that's my stuff. Yeah, I have a few items I brought it for, for show and tell. Uh, I like going to uh, auctions. And uh, what, anybody know about the Harker's auction there in 206 in Tabernacle? And uh, normally they have it on Thursdays and uh, Saturdays. And on Thursdays they have like uh, estate type things. And on uh, Saturdays they have livestock, chickens, ducks, you know, things like that. It's like a farming community. And uh, so I picked up this uh, RCA radio. And uh, I'm not sure if it has the right knobs on it. But it's a, uh, but it's a 1945-1946 uh, radio. It's a, it's a broadcast and a shortwave band on it. And uh, you know, I decided to plug it in. I plugged it in. I was surprised it actually worked. No hum, and it worked pretty good. And I think they kept it in the kitchen because there was, like, you can see like little greasy spots on it from where it was in the kitchen. But uh, yeah, so I'm kind of really happy with this radio that it worked. And I, the only thing that I have to do with this is uh, perhaps fix the dial cord on it because that's not working. Then the other thing that I have is uh, I had a friend of mine that, that gave me a, a bunch of computer power supplies. And I decided that I would, uh, this is a regular 12 volt power supply like you use in a server. And I have a friend of mine that restores old cars, and he asked me to test the ignition coil for him. So what I did is I converted this into an ignition coil tester. And uh, the way it works is uh, I have a 555 timer in here that runs on an oscillator. And then there's a uh, General Motors uh, ignition module inside here that's pulsed by the 555 timer. And then it runs the coil. And like, hey, anybody want to see how this works? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm going to need to get some power. All right. Now, when you, anytime you work with high voltage, this can uh, shock the living crap out of you. And so you've got to really be careful with this. And normally when you work with high voltage, there's a good idea to keep one hand in your pocket. That way you don't have a complete circuit through your heart. And uh, all right, put this over here. You hang with that? All right. This uh, type of coil is a, a lost spark type of coil that they use on a lot of new cars. That actually, one coil fires two spark plugs, and both the spark plugs fire at the same time. And the, the way that works out is your engine timing is such that your comp uh, power stroke on one engine, and I believe the exhaust on the other at the same time, so one spark plug is actually firing and not doing anything. So uh, that's why you have the two nibs on the top of it. But which makes it kind of nice is that you can actually have a spark jump between those two points. All right. And uh, the, the way this is set up is the 555 uh, runs at about uh, 20 cycles all the way to 400 cycles. And 400 cycles gives you about uh, 6,000 RPM on a V8 engine. So that's kind of 
the reason I built it in that range. And if you start going too fast with this coil, it's not really designed to operate at a real high frequency. You know, just, uh, okay, here we go. All right. That, that's what it's doing now. It's just idling right now. And then we step on the gas. And now that, that sound you're hearing is actually the air being heated up and it's making the air vibrate. And if you're close to it, you can actually smell the ozone. It creates ozone. I think it's starting to break up right about there. All right. So that could uh, play with the theremin then, too. Uh, yeah, I guess you could. Yeah. And the, uh, one of the other things you can do is uh, I have a... Uh, neon bulb on here, which I can connect to it. I'm just going to unplug this just to be on the safe side. I haven't tried just keeping it at a, uh, at a short distance because I really don't want to have a spark jump and get me. This isn't like a Tesla coil. This will shock the crap out of you. Where a Tesla coil might just kind of sit on your surface of your skin because this runs at a much lower frequency. A lot quieter. So with neon gas, uh, it, uh, it basically ignites at about probably like 90 volts or something like that. So right now you're just, uh, you're not get developing the high voltage, you're actually, uh, you know, it's running at the higher current. One thing about an ignition coil, when it's uh, running open like that without a, a spark plug, you're actually creating a lot of extra voltage and you can actually cause the coil to break down because that energy's got to go somewhere. It's just like a, you know, a RF transmitter. If you don't have it terminated with the, with the proper antenna, you're going to have issues with you know, the reflected power and things like that. In this case, you just uh, start arcing inside the coil. You start, might start breaking the insulation down. Okay. But if anybody's interested in uh, you know, uh, a circuit of this, I can give them a copy of the circuit if they wanted to play around with it. And these parts are basically off-the-shelf parts that you can uh, buy, like the ignition module is from like uh, the first GM cars that came out with the ignition module, so nothing fancy there, probably about maybe $12, $15 for the module itself. And then you have a 555 with a couple of components, and then you have these coils that, that uh, you can, you know, pick up. Some of the coils actually come up, but like some of the uh, six cylinders will have a coil pack of three of these together, and you can have a lot of fun with them. You can get a lot more voltage out because you can run them out of phase, and then you can develop a higher voltage. You can have them, you know, actually combining. All right, I got one more thing. And, uh, yeah, uh, I, I was also at, a, at the Berlin flea market. Anybody knows where that is? And there's a guy that buys, okay, there's a guy that buys, like, things that get returned to Amazon or some of these other places, and he buys pallets and stuff. And he had these uh, ham radios. These, this is a two-meter radio. And... Uh, I picked it up and it's a uh, it's a nice little radio. One of the best things I like on it, it uh, it has an FM band. You can listen to your FM radio while you're trying to communicate. Is that what that is? That's exactly what it is. Yeah, that's probably why he had them. I'm sure maybe Customs caught them and they. I don't I don't know how he, I don't know how he ended up, but he had them new in the box. And uh, I just got this one set up for uh, you know repeater use in my area, and. Uh, you know, I've had my ham license probably for about uh, uh, three years now, and I'm also a VE, so like for testing for a VE. So, you know. Uh, this is a RETG I5. I'll show it to you. you Want to look at it? Yeah, whatever that is. Okay, anybody have any questions? All right. All right. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it has a flashlight, yeah. Well, one thing about the Chinese, they're not worried about patent rights, I guess. Oh, uh, well. They want to share with everybody. Yeah, no, they copyrights. They, they have the right to copy. <laughs> <laughs> um, our club is broken up into uh, different sections, in my mind. There are people who love to finish the cabinets, 
people who love to display their radios, and then there are those people who like to fix them. And uh, I'm one of those who likes to fix them. So uh, I came across some of these things that I built when I was uh, oh, wow. a And uh, well, after getting into this hobby as a teenager, after a while you realize, oh, you got a workbench. You got to have a box that does things for you on your workbench. So at the age of 16, I'm not going to get this out of here. I put this together, and, uh, you know, it allows you to connect up a speaker and you know, different jacks. Um, it allows inputs to uh, RCA jacks or quarter-inch jacks or pin jacks, things like that, switches to control them. Uh, plenty of uh, outlets, although this is the downside of it. I only have two connector outlets here, and they don't... Mm -hmm. Um, provide a thicker uh, one for the ground so it's pretty useless now in, in that case and th th I didn't use um, uh, green leaf punches because I didn't own them at the time so this was a lot of work to file this out and uh, I like of course there's an amplifier in there and also a cheap a Lafayette transmitter, AM transmitter is in here. Uh, so, that was the first one of these I put together. Yeah. 16. And uh, so, a little later I got a little more uh, into it, and th this is a uh, Bell Systemized Bose 901 equalizer, if some of you know what that is. And uh, the people at work had figured out the circuit board, and so we just pop in all the values, go down to the stock room or the gift shop, they used to call it, and, uh, and, and get the components put together. And I used this for a long time. Uh, yeah, I was uh, taken back by the idea of a speaker system that uses four inch speakers having any bass. Right. But they put eight speakers together and uh, it was an additive arrangement and it really did work. Um, I was involved with the first series of it, series one, which required a hundred watts RMS per channel, which I didn't have. And uh, so I had to sell my money and uh, buy a big Kenwood back-breaking amplifier to run this, but boy, it sounded good. Mm -hmm. uh, so, anyway, uh, let's go to Kutztown now. I, I came, uh, the inside of the radio I'm working on, so I didn't bring it. This radio uh, intrigued me because it said wide fi 10-inch speaker. Okay? Yeah, what? So I had to get it and see what the hell they were talking about. So this this is their 10-inch speaker. Two, two by 10. <laughs> I've never seen another one used anywhere else. What brand is that? Westinghouse. GE did a lot of that. <laughs> oh, and now the intense. All right. And the other interesting thing I found in Kutztown this time around, um, actually it was last year, I didn't go this year yet, is if you win a uh, golf tournament, you can get this prize, I guess. It's an AM FM radio with a golf ball in the middle. And the uh, the tuning, um, uh, you, you'll, you'll look at what channel you're on and you'll notice that it's a golf club in there. So and it sits up like this, so it looks pretty cool. And it works. And that's it. So, you know how this goes. You, there's always some 
junk guy that you know and you ask him, you know, you ever get any old radios? You know, oh, yeah, yeah. So I stopped by this place near my house, a nice old, nice fellow, older fellow, and um, Larry the cat wasn't there that day. Sometimes I, I get to see Larry, but Larry was out somewhere. Um, farm cats, it's sort of like a farm with this junk store in front of it. And you know how it is when they find something for you, they think they've got something really good, and, and you think, well, they were nice enough to save it for me and think of me, so I'll yeah, buy it, okay. even though I don't really want it. No, you know. So this is a this is a Japanese kitschy thing. This is how well it's going to work. Oh, well, we're getting a lot of stations. I'll use this in the DX contest. Okay, come on. Um, but anyway, it's a um, AM radio binocular case. Very. Uh, I I can't get the battery to sit in its little cradle, but you know, very very 60s, very Japanese. Heritage seven by thirty-five. I forget what does seven by thirty-five mean with binoculars. I always forget. Front, front. Okay, so and the seven is there is the rear lens. Is magnification. magnification. Okay, I, I can never I can never keep that straight. But anyway, this is. Uh, Big, yeah, that's you know, the, so you, you know, I, I kind of like. I must say, I do kind of like this Japanese kind of '60s novelty stuff. It's sort of fun. Well, the radio's in the top, right? Yeah, the radio's in the top, and and it appeals to the Johnny Tronics lads because it's an uncalibrated dial. So you just fish around until you hear a station that you like, because it's like my homebrews where you just kind of. Yeah, that's. Uh, I guess for bird watch, and there was so there was this young guy there, and he goes, "That's just an AM radio, no FM." And I said, "No," and he kind of grunted like, "Oh, you know, that's useless." But he's right. But you know, so anyway, that's it. But it's fun. Nine volt. Yeah, nine volt battery. Yes. Sir. Okay, I'm Dave Snellman. In case you don't know who I am, uh, you probably have all heard of the Zenith Transoceanic series of radios. You probably all might have heard of morale radios. These were radios that the military issued uh, to entertain the troops. Well, combine both of these and you got the Zenith model. First off, the Z first model was the Zenith R-520. This was designed for the Korean era, radio, uh, Korean era time frame. However, by the time the production model was run, the Korean conflict was over. So these uh, probably had a run of about 7,000 units. Uh, this is a very ruggedized radio. Uh, they identify the, the b different bands, their, their color codes, and same on the, uh, the, uh, the dial, actually. A little light on the subject there, and now that's a reproduction plate, but it is a, an original uh, military-style radio. Now, the one crazy thing about this is, if you get one of these radios and you try to open the back by pulling on it, you're not going to get anywhere. There's a not little catch you must. Uh, hold to release. Okay. And I'm going to have to get a little help here because let me. it's a lot different inside. These were a definitely military uh, spec units. Uh, they all have tube shields. They have a protective cover over the the switch, the band switching assembly. They have a, the 110, 220 power supply module there. They're fused. The headphone jack is always on the back, and you get a set of spare tubes, including the little um, um, so, no, well, you got the 106, but you also get the 50A1. Yes. Now this one has just a straight power cord. 
but it has adapters for all sorts of other power cords. Now, I don't have all of them, but they have this little gizmo. And if you had this, you could plug six D cells, or as the military called them, BA-30s, in there. And you could connect three additional 30-volt uh, batter military-style batteries to it, plug that into the power supply, and power your radio. They had another adapter that lets you plug directly into uh, any uh, 9 and 90-volt uh, uh, battery supply. And there was still yet another one that uh, connected to a different style series of batteries. But you have your uh, little antenna extension cable. And the original manual that came with this was almost 200 pages long. So uh, it's, it's available online. You can get this and download it free from Bama. If you want to know the theory behind the xenotransoceanic, it identifies every part and tells the, how the system works. And this one also goes into the later model, which I'll go into in a minute. But uh, this is a great book to download if you, if, you need, if you want to learn the theory of the transoceanic. But this would, in theory, fit in here. This is a little... Uh, with, with the additional uh, um, the schematics, it doesn't quite fit in the, the packet. But uh, so, David, what year was that again? this was uh, 1953 um, uh, production run, and That's no, it's, it's oil skin. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people there. A lot of sea people will build these out of. Uh, They'll combine a bunch of uh, TOs to make the, what they call the Franken transoceanics, but uh, these Franken radios. But this is an oil skin. What were they used for? If it was the, the war for? Uh, it was uh, it was given to the PXs, okay. and they were, would rent it out. And probably some of them never got returned. Hence, uh, why now this should have. Uh, it does have the USA label on the. Uh, it doesn't have the USA label up front, but it does have the tag on here. They actually used to have orange painting that said USA, and people would like they would er erase that to make it less. Exactly. <laughs> so, but you know, it, it, there's no logo on the uh, the the wave magnet. Uh, but uh, this was, and there were, was probably around 7,000 of these made. So this was uh, a very rare uh, Xena transoceanic. But we've got one that's even more rare. And this is the 520A. Now this one is a 1956 uh, um, uh, contract that was made. Looks like the 6000 6, series has USA on it, has USA on the side here in gold. Uh, and this was designed to be drop shipped uh, at one time to be drop shipped I think for the Bay of Pigs. So uh, a lot of these ended up in Cuba and there's stories that uh, this later became Fidel's favorite radio. <laughs> but who knows? Um, this one uh, has the wave magnet, doesn't have the uh, little booklet up there. Uh, it's not quite as ruggedized or doesn't even have the... But it does have the uh, tube shields, Got your power, uh, power adapter. There, there's no shielding there. The schematic is just the schematic taped into the back of the uh, uh, cabinet. And this one uh, does have the infamous battery connection, the yellow uh, adapter. And this was a, is a metal case, but it does the same thing. Now they, these also were heavily fungicide, fi, si, fungicided. That, which is that uh, putting uh, yellow-greenish yellow gook stuff on. 
And you notice the 50A1 does not have a tube shield. That is on purpose. That's not missing. Now these are identified by USA being em embossed in the back. So now this one, there were less than 3,000 of these made. And at some, some point, uh, I read somewhere that someone said these were probably made for the generals. I don't know. Uh, this was uh, the person that got this radio before I did claims that they got it from a lieutenant colonel. And it has the odd fused power plug on it. The early one uh, does not. But, uh, and it does have, again, it's fused, power supply. Uh, you got the little fuse holders uh, secured to the back of the radio. The, these are screws that hold the uh, extra antenna lead in place. And uh, both of these work. Both of these are original. They have not been touched. Uh, the frequencies are the same as the typical Yep. Mm -hmm. the, uh, it even has a little pivot for putting the antenna on. The, uh, now this one is interesting in that if you look closely, it says 4 to 8 megahertz here, or megacycles, they call them then. That one is labeled as 4 to 9 megahertz. Um, I haven't really been able to find too much information about that, other than there was a possibility it was used by other branches for other purposes. Yeah, who knows? Well, well, well the A and the B600, which were like the last garage of 600, mm -hmm. But, Whereas the other ones were 4 to 8. But this was 1953. Oh, that has it on that too? No. This is 4 to 8. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. So, interesting. yes, <laughs> I, I thought. But uh, I did find uh, not a whole lot of information on the web about this. But I did come across a, an interesting article. The problem is I don't capiche. Yeah. No. It's in Italian. Oh my God. There's beautiful photos, but uh, so anyone that <laughs> reads Italian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that's a. But yeah, that's the story of these. These were considered morale radios. Uh, uh, they, they were listed as being, you know, the, the military. I mean, uh, they, these are Signal Corps contracts. Okay. I think they were designed, obviously I would think with all of drab, it might be Army, but who knows. Okay. And there were only, uh, then this, the serial number on this one is 2909. So this is probably one of the later ones. Yes, that's a real plate. Did they put anything to recognize the whip antenna? No. So they were just the same problem? The same thing, but again, these are all original, and this... What you're saying is that the one... The Bahia didn't take the port. The Bahia didn't take the port. Yeah, yeah. Well... We'll get it to stay down. Twisted 90 degrees. There we go. And this one again. Now the, these, the, the capacitors used in these are not your simple paper caps. They're all mylar caps. Yes. Again, they're all mil spec caps. And like I said, if you get this, you can find out what every nut and bolt is. It lists every capacitor uh, and uh, the purpose and all that stuff of each one. But, and how it all works. But uh, these are, they're rare, I like them, and uh, that's it. Last night's Zoom call, uh, we were talking, and Rich brought up some of the things that happened, and you mentioned Gordon Chin last night, and, and uh, John was in on the Zoom calls, while the rest of you were probably not around. 
Gordon was putting together a piece of test equipment. I don't remember something specifically what the test equipment was, but a spectrum analyzer, thank you. And he, he started out by saying, but this thing is like really weird. It has a lot of weird components and it's got uh, a solid state power supply. However, yeah. it's got a tube voltage regulator in the thing. Yeah, like so that was just kind of weird. So it, it kind of made me think, and, and I mentioned this during the Zoom meeting last night, and I'll just repeat it for over here. When I was in high school, I had a friend whose family didn't have a lot of money. The guy was a little bit older than me. And uh, I think his great uncle had passed away, and he got his 56 Chevy four-door. But nothing to get excited about because it was an ugly car. It had dents and rust. It really was rusty bad. And uh, I, met, I had him in like two or three of my classes. He was a senior. I was a junior. He says, hey, listen, can you help me get the car running? Uh, so I helped him get his car running. And we, put, we bought points and new plugs and got the thing running. And he could run and drive it now. He was all happy. And then a week later, he came back to me at the end of a class we were in. And he says, hey, listen, you know, I really appreciate everything you did for me. Help me get the car going. But it's got this weird problem. And I said, what? He says, well, I turned the radio on in the dash. If I'm driving at night, the whole floor lights up. And it's like I have, it's almost like there's a light or something in there. I'm like, oh, God. So go over his house on the weekend. And uh, he had a part-time job. He worked at Kmart right over by Marconi Park. There used to be at Kmart. He worked there. And I waited for him to get out of work. And then we got together. And what happened was Chevy used a two-piece radio. So in other words, you had the head unit, had your RF deck and all the components in there, and then you had a separate amplifier and speaker and everything. So I'm thinking, well, what's going on? You know, so we waited for it to get dark, and he turns the radio on, and sure enough, you know, here's this bright thing that's <laughs> shining the floor. He says, listen, my girlfriend don't like it when she's wearing a skirt and that thing lights up. She thinks, you know, he's showing, all right. So I took that half of the thing out, which was a pay to neck, by the way. I get it out. And of course, that was a, a vibrator radio. So you have to have a voltage regulator in that so that it just maintains a constant B plus voltage. So I go into the thing, I take, the, take it out, I set it down on a table and I looked at it and I just shook my head. I said, here's your problem, Bill, right here, you see this? and had one of these, and then John mentioned it at the Zoom meeting last night. This is an OZ4 voltage regular without the cover. So when this thing lights up, it's like this bright purple. It's like putting a fluorescent light on your dash when you turn the radio on. So I, I said, okay, drive home, go through all my tubes and find, you know, something like this, an OZ4 that had a cover. I slapped it in there, put it back in the car. And problem went away. He says, that's all it was? I said, yeah, that's all it was. So, thus, you know, and then John mentioned, well, it was probably a G-tube, and this is what a uh, OZ4 G-tube looks like. You know, it has no cover on whatsoever. And this is really bright when it's gone. So, they're rare. You don't see these around, but I had one sitting around my shop, so I figured I'd bring and show it everybody. Really nice. That's it. I got a couple of boxes. <laughs> Ray, Ray, about two or three years ago, gave me this huge box, which I still have, by the way, and I, I appreciated you giving it to me. Vibrators, four, five, six-pin vibrators, different voltages. So I still have all that. So, But thank you. That, that's all I had here. Uh, some time ago, never mind a rabbit hole. That, that's mild. I, uh, I think I went over a cliff and possibly over Niagara Falls maybe twice with getting into uh, vintage camera photography, mostly uh, bridge units and digital. So I don't know if any of you saw a posting I put on the communicator when I was doing some experiments with seeing if I could get the uh, Kodachrome look, which I'm in love with. I don't have any of it. I'm probably gonna buy some slides off eBay just to have a few so I can compare. But I think I got real close one night. I was bored on my vacation. I had. Uh, camera up on the uh, tripod and I'll show you the camera that was and my wife had been watching a Walt Disney parade that was done in like you know you had to be there type quality I've never seen anything like it so just for a goof I had the camera on a tripod and I'm testing out the remote control I don't know if it works or not so I'm sitting there snapping them off snapping them off I look at the pictures and there's this guy dressed as an army man in a jeep 
and it had a little handheld radio, you know, uh, uh, fakey in the Jeep. And I said, oh boy, I'm going to have fun with this. So I put on communicator and says, can anybody tell me what kind of radio that would be period correct for the Jeep? And everybody responded, they're like, when were you in Disney World, this, that. The picture was off the television set. Nobody could tell. Right out of the camera. So that, that's what started to pique my interest. This little guy here is called an Olympus C5050. Uh, it's probably circa around 2003 or so. It's only 5 megapixel, but this was um, one of their high-end offerings to the uh, people that were starting to go what were they called filmless. And in so doing with the, the whole filmless thing, if you take a look at this, this particular type of card looks almost like a piece of film. It's very old. It's a... Uh, let me see if they have the voltage on here. They might. I think this is a 3.3 volt, 128 megabyte smart media card. You don't see them too often. And this camera can shoot smart media, and it can shoot compact flash, and it also takes an XD card. So you've got three different kinds, and you can run two of them at the same time. So all of this in a package that costed the consumer probably about almost $800 back in the day. The body's made out of magnesium. And uh, it's, it's a real good performer. I'm going to put some links out of some of the pictures it's done on Instagram when I get a chance. And you guys can see uh, what kind of quality you get out of this. To wrap it up, this camera was on eBay. I have another one that's in better condition than this uh, for $14.98. Camera's broken. You know, selling. The guy had a spread that looked like a smorgasbord for cameras. He had every possible accessory, book. Uh, adapter, uh, lens, uh, uh, polarizers, and so on and so forth. And uh, there were six days on the auction. I didn't have the $14 at the time, so I tried to email a guy and say, uh, you know, can I give you like, uh, I'll give you, you know, $15 or $16, just hold it for me. Never, never, he got the email, I never got the email. Long story short, I'm sitting in my, my uh, class I take on Tuesdays, there's 15 minutes left on the auction. Six days, nobody bid on it. Because he wanted $23 shipping. They figured it was a scam. So with 15 seconds left, I threw 25 bucks on it. I got it. It all came in. He gives me the original eBay paperwork when he bought it all brand new. And I look at it, $990. Wow. Then I polish the camera up, slap some fresh batteries in it, and takes it right off. I've been using it ever since. I felt bad. I wrote the guy back, so I'll give you some more money. Turns out he's about 88 years old, a retired engineer in California, ph uh, Olympus photography enthusiast. And he was like, God bless, enjoy it. And I was like, okay, cool. So in addition to that guy, my latest acquisition, uh, and I, I am actually done buying cameras now. I finally got everything rounded out where I'm happy. Um, this one here is a little bit harder to come by in good condition and for a reasonable amount of money. Back in the day, uh, by the way, if you, anybody needs a great card for white balance, I made this at work on the printer. So download the picture, it's free, cut it out, put some scotch tape on the back, and it works great. I didn't have six dollars for that either. <laughs> I have to save for everything. This is a Tiffin 58 millimeter circular polarizer that works wonders if you're trying to do like Kodachrome that deep blue sky and pop clouds kind of stuff. I got this for very reasonable money, new old stock on eBay. Absolutely mint. And Tiffin is a, a pretty uh, respectable uh, company. So the, the grand prize is, and after much research, this is an Olympus DSLR, my first and only one. It's called the E500 model. This was put together as a joint effort between uh, Kodak and Olympus and has the last Kodak sensor in it. It's a CCD, obviously, most of all of these are. And this guy shoots so close to Kodachrome, it's unbelievable. I will uh, be posting some pictures. The lens is the uh, digital version lens, but there was something that Olympus did after a while. The back is no longer metal, it was plastic. They cheapen these things down. But these are the, are the good kit lenses that it originally came with. Unfortunately, I did not get it with the kit lens, um, the, you know, the extension lens. This, this whole set with two lenses was about 900 bucks when it came out. It's got a sticker on there that made it look ugly. I paid 13 bucks for that on eBay. They go for a lot more. 
So this is the 40 to 150 millimeter and the one that comes with the camera, they sold it singly also, was this little guy here that does a great job. Same thing, digital, 14 to 45. So if you happen to pick up one of these, you want to play around with, with some uh, vintage looking, you know, Kodachrome type photography, I can highly recommend this model. I paid about, uh, I think about 70 bucks for this with the, with the first lens and $13 for that. So it worked out really well. Did Kodak market that as something that they engineered to give you the Kodachrome look? They hinted at it and they absolutely were after um, capturing a little bit more uh, market share, I guess, with Olympus because this is a four-thirds camera, not a micro. And Panasonic, Olympus, and Leica and other manufacturers agreed to make interchangeable accessories with the four-thirds uh, format. So if I buy a Panasonic lens that's not a micro four-thirds, it'll fit. If I buy a Panasonic, it'll fit Sigma, Leica, or whatever. Um, I really don't have a budget for some of that stuff right at the moment, but yes? Yeah, what is the Kodachrome look? Kodachrome uh, is very uh, heavily saturated with reds, blues, everything pops. The greens are very vivid. So when you look at the picture, it's almost like you want to jump into it. You know, and they were mostly uh, slide pictures. So you put your, your Kodachrome into your reel, put it on your thing, and you would have a, you know, coffee and cake or whatever. But also, um, if you want to jump into anything with film, there is the Ektar 100. I've seen a lot of samples of this that replaces Kodachrome. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I have two, uh, they're not here tonight, but I have two Nikon D50s, or no, N50s, and they're film cameras. Uh, I think I was at, at uh, Goodwill, and I think they wanted like 15 or $20 for it. I didn't even know if it worked. The batteries cost me almost more than the camera did. So I, I originally uh, went with that to test that everything worked fine. I have not really shot film yet, I will. Um, but if you have any of the older film cameras that take these little, uh, little tiny battery packs that they want a lot of money for it, you can't find them anywhere, don't worry about it. Go on eBay, buy the CR123 rechargeable battery. You get four of them in a charger for $12. Here's the trick. A Nikon, for whatever reason, you open up the battery compartment and there's, there's the metal crossover plate. As if you could put a double A in it. Don't fit, but it's there. And I'm like, what do you put that there for? I said, okay, no problem. Slapped in two 123s, which I bought from ShopRite, rolled up some tin foil, put it in there to carry the current, slapped it shut, there we go. And the rechargeables work beautiful. So now I have an expensive set of lithiums for 12 bucks, and for 12 bucks I got four rechargeables now. And uh, uh, that's right, I don't think you guys know Gary. He's, he's a ham, but he's not a member of the club. He runs a planetarium in Patterson. He gets me on the radio one day and he goes, uh, yeah, the kids were cleaning out this, that, and the other thing. He says, I have something called a Nikon uh, N65. Do you know what that is? I said, I know exactly what that is. He said, well, you can have it. I said, good, bring it to work. <laughs> I give it a home. So there's the last camera. But anyway, that's pretty much what I play around with. Uh, very quickly, this is a lot more modern. Uh, this is a Canon SX30 that my son bought on a, on a Pulse m -Buy. He decided he didn't want it. I got into photography, walked out of the bedroom, said, here. I said, okay. It has a 35x zoom and can take uh, 720 uh, HD video. The video on this is pretty spectacular. The zoom, yeah. these all suffer from the same thing. I call it uh, triple S, small sensor syndrome. So that's one problem you're going to have if you're, uh, a room like this is particularly challenging because of the way the shadows are and stuff. These don't have the big sensors in them. But there's a workaround for that. And I'll show you real quickly. I don't want to take up too much time here. Anyway, what you need for these guys is external flash unit. So I've been scouting on eBay for a long time. I got this as a great price. This is a Nikon SB26. Nothing particularly unusual about it except that second window there. So what can this guy do? This guy, when you shoot your flash off of any camera you own, it sees it, it shoots. So if you want to do like macro or you want to hold it up, you can do whatever you want with it. 
as long as it sees the flash from even the smallest camera you have, it will light up what you want it to. The nice thing is, this particular model, and it's not broken in this one, has uh, in the front of it what's called the, the diffuser, but to diffuse the light, but you also get a white bounce card, what's called a catch light. So you have this on top, you bounce off the ceiling, it bounces off the card, and it illuminates the face of the person you're taking the picture of, and puts a little sparkle in their eye. They call it the catch light. So I was real happy to eventually find one of these. There's a guy on uh, YouTube called The Angry Photographer. He's a little bit off on the deep side, but he did an extensive review of the Nikon flashes, and that's what turned me on to it. I didn't know about that uh, beforehand. So I finally acquired that. That'll work with every camera I own. And last but not least, oh, the one that I really coveted and couldn't afford was, yep, yeah, you get the official Olympus bag. That's, that's money right there. If you have it with the bag, even if it's broken, it's $300, right? You know, I mean, right off the bat. Because where are you going to get an Olympus bag? <laughs> this this kind of aggravated me, this purchase. This is the Olympus FL50 that goes to three of my vintage cameras. I bought an FL40 out of Arizona for $20 that had all the accessories with it, the grip, the this, the that, the cable, right? So I get these other cameras, I look in the owner's manual, oh, you can use any flash you want except the FL40. So if you have the FL40, you might as well pick up the FL36 or the FL50 or you're out of luck. And I'm like, nice. So now I've got to buy another one. So I got some money off on this. It's about 76 bucks shipped, but you notice the diffuser's not here. I wasn't real happy about that. Guy goes, oh, the flash is like brand new. This and the other thing. I said, look, a brand new flash wouldn't have this missing. And I said, I'm not saying you did anything wrong or you tried to dupe me. I said, maybe you didn't realize this wasn't in here. It has a micro switch in the back with a bar. When you slap this in, it knows if it's in or out. And if you don't actuate this switch, it locks out some of the functions. It is absolutely mint brand new. Uh, I'll give you that. But uh, without that little piece in there, well, that's a bit of a problem. So I don't know if I have it here or not. Um, I might, and if I don't, no big deal. But I'll check real quick just in case. I do. I went to work and saw the electrical foreman. I says, Brandon, those uh, light fixtures up there with the diffusers, I said, do you ever get a little broken piece or anything like that? He goes, yeah, I got plenty of it. I said, do you have a little piece? So I sat down with a, uh, as Rich has uh, said before, you go to the supermarket, Little or Liddell, however you pronounce it, and you get these little uh, Dremel knockoff tools called a Parkside. They're more handy than you think. They're not Dremels, but uh, you can definitely make stuff out of it. So here's a diffuser plate. This one, if you take it and you put it in here, this guy's designed to actuate the switch. So now it knows panel in. Well, what about panel out? Okay. So you take some more diffuser material and a piece of clear tape, and you take this guy, and it's too short to hit the switch. Bend it down like that under the two tabs, and there's your diffuser. If you could buy one for this model, it's online for the FL36. They want 50 bucks for the replacement part. I contacted Olympus, they don't have any. So I said, you know what? I got me a Parkside Dremel from the grocery store. I'm making me one. <laughs> and that worked out pretty well. So that's about it. Um, hopefully I'll be able to put some of this equipment to good use for um, club events and things that where we want to do some pictures and stuff like that. We've got some equipment available to get a different perspective other than what you get out of the modern day cameras that have like the uh, CMOS and uh, I believe they have now have a live MOS sensor that's out there and they do make fantastic pictures I'll grant you that but I'll tell you what there's nothing that looks like what these guys do this was back in the day when they were trying to sell you uh, something at home you know the uh, smart media card and all that oh look it's a filmless camera and if you get our printer that you know communicates with our camera and this and the other thing you can have your pictures right at your kitchen table. And nothing is cropped because these shoot in the 3-2 aspect ratio. If you take something off your phone and you go ahead and you shoot that and you go to Walmart, now you get this box around your picture. You pick what part you want to throw away. 
If you have a camera that shoots in 3-2 in the first place, it does two things. You get a 4x6, no crop, 8x10, no prop. So there's the 8x10 glossy problem solved. And that's why I've been having a lot of fun with it. I know some professional photographers would probably think I'm kind of a nut job, but um, it's a lot of fun. And uh, the cost isn't all that heavy as long as you don't overpay for the equipment as you go along. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, thanks for letting me share. My name is Robert Forte. What I wanted to bring and talk about is the, what I think is the world's smallest television station, complete with a camera, color camera, complete with three batteries, complete with a transmitter for the camera, and, the, and four lights, four LED lights. So I haven't brought anything up here, so you're wondering, well, where is it? Does anybody know what? Yes. So anyway, does anybody know what this is? It's a pill cam. That's right. So this is a pill cam. This is a medical device. It's part of the what they call the wireless endoscopy. I have to give you just a brief little physiology lesson to see why this works and why this was invented. So think of your body as basically a tube. It starts here, ends here. You put food in your mouth, you digest the food, and the food is already digested by the salivary glands, repairs. You're chewing it, it goes down into your stomach, the stomach acids break down the, the proteins into amino acids. From there, it goes into your 26 feet of small intestine. And it's fed by the enzymes from the pancreas and the liver to break everything down. From there, it goes into the large, into large colon, and there, about five feet, and that's function of the large colon is to just extract water. And that's your system. Boom, 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 comes out. And as want and as things happen, things go wrong. So if you have a problem with the salivary glands or your teeth chewing and breaking down the food, you go to your dentist. Anything in the throat, you'll go to your, your nose throat guy. Anything down here, your stomach and your gut, colon, go to gastroenterologist. But here's the problem. The problem is, is that if, as a dentist, you can look in, you can see everything. You don't have to put any scopes. But if you want to see the throat, if you want to see the esophagus, you want to see the stomach, you have to have an endoscopy, an endoscope, which they put through your nose, down into your stomach, or down in your, in your esophagus. And you can see everything. On the other end, you check the other side, the large intestine, the large colon. They put a tube up there, because it's about five feet. And, and I incidentally, commercial. Anybody over 40 years old should definitely get a colonoscopy every 10 years, please. My father died of it. I'm very sensitive about that. Anyway, so they have a scope, same endoscopy scope that goes up the rear end, and they can see, and they can see the tissue, and they can see the color, and they can see if it's, it's a growth. But what about the 26 feet of small intestine? Well, there's no way to get that endoscopy into the small intestine. So two Jewish guys in Israel in 1997 invented the pill cam. You're welcome to see this afterwards, but basically it's a camera, four LEDs, blinking, three batteries, and then you have um, uh, the transmitter. You swallow this. What you're wearing, and this, this, trans, this is interactive. What you're wearing while this is in you is a pack, and I I'm sorry, it, there's, there's no slides, but the pack that you're gonna wear is like, a, is like this. This is like a, like a Sony Walkman. You're gonna walk around with that. So on the outside of your body, you got this pack, and then the pack goes to either one of two ways, which are antennas. It's either a belt with the pack, or you have like the um, EKG leads, if you've ever had an EKG. So you have leads. So the two types of harnesses, one is in the belt, or you can have them in the harnesses. And they hook up to this. Now, these two things are talking to one another. It's, this is crazy. They talk to one another. So you're going to swallow this, OK? This knows to not turn on for about an hour, an hour and a half. And it's communicating back and forth. If this device senses that it's not going anywhere, 
you get a dong, you get a big, you get a signal. It's telling you, take some laxative because you're stuck in your stomach. It's crazy. So it goes, so you take that anyway. This will travel through. Let me describe this thing. The camera is a uh, color camera. It's got a, a view, it's a fisheye. It's a view of 172 degrees. This is 182. Basically, you're seeing everything in front of you. The batteries are three batteries, and the, th the, the four LEDs here, because there's no light in your gut, will flash. Once it gets into your stomach, it senses it's in your stomach, and it's ready to go out. The frame rate on the camera is anywhere from 6 to 35 frames per second. Per second. And, this, and because your small intestine is small, it'll, when it goes into your small intestine, it's either going to go head first, so it'll see what's in front of you, or if it goes tail first, it's going to see everything behind you. And as this frame rate is determined by how fast this is going through your gut, this, it communicates. So if this thing is traveling fast through your gut, you're going to have a high 35 per second frame rate because they have to see everything. If it's stuck, it drops down to six. Anyway, this thing, this thing has a little personal note. This has a personal relationship with my wife. She had to take this when she was sick. She had a, and I heard about what she had, and I literally fished for this thing for two days. Cleaned it off, sterilized it, don't worry. And uh, because this is, this is a really unique thing. Now, in the large intestine, when it gets to the large intestine, the large intestine is large. So what happens is, this is gonna tumble. It can tumble. It can't tumble in your small intestine because it's got to go either one way or the other way. So it's tumbling. So these geniuses put together a, a capsule with cameras on both ends so that they could go through the large intestine and they could see everything at 360 degrees. So 360 degrees minus, it's so about 60 degrees of, this, of the search area they can't see, but the rest, almost three on six, they can see everything in front and everything in back. So that as it's tumbling, it's going to record everything. The efficiency of this is great. It, it mimics uh, regular colonoscopy by a doctor. When would you use it? Well, if a patient's compromised, if they have colitis, they, they, don't, uh, they don't want to put them through anything. They don't want to do an exploratory, okay, but it cuts you open. So this is, this is the tool that, uh, that did it. It's called a pill can. This cost about $500 at the time, about 10 years ago. Uh, there's more money on the other end because they have to have a doctor interpret this. Do the, because uh, everything is recorded in. Oh, you, incidentally, you can see as this is going through, this is a, a live color camera. So you can see everything live, but it also records it so that when you can give that back to the doctor and you can put it in and you can, you can have the, pull the, uh, all the information out of this thing. Um, what else? Uh, well, it was invented in 1997, and it came out in 2001. It's still used. And, and you know, comp patients compromise. You say, you want to take a pill, do you want to, you want to, you want to solve a job, do you want to do an MRI? You know, there are different things. MRIs are in the tube. So it has its purpose. It's cheaper, actually. By the time you figure the cost of this and the doctor to interpret it, it's actually cheaper. But it's an adjunct. That's well. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely natural. When I retrieved this thing after a day and a half, the LEDs were still blinking. <laughs> Honest to God, it's, this, it, 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 it blinked for another day, and then of course it died. But uh, it's amazing. It's an amazing tool. This is two guys in Tel Aviv. That's who, who made this thing. Great. Any questions? And, and, and that was over twenty years ago. Yeah. Yeah, probably. The first, well, the first, the first one was with two batteries. But the first one, they, they only had a, a sweep of 154 degrees. So this was the second generation. So the 154 look angle went to 172. Then they, they put the extra battery. So then they started this, the, the second generation actually communicated. So if it got stuck someplace in your gut, the thing went off. There was a ding, 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 whatever it was, whatever the ding was. It was a oral 
signal that we've got a problem, take some laxative. And then it would continue. So the second generation was an interactive thing. Because I always wondered, how do the frame rate, the frame rate goes from six per second to 35. I mean, how does this know? And then doing the research, it communicates. Because this, this thing, and with the harness, can figure out where it is, how, it's, how fast it's going. So if the signal is moving this way, it can figure out, especially with the, the leads, like the EKG leads, it can figure out where it's going, how fast it's going. So it adjusts to telemetry or whatever, electronics, radio waves. So anyway, that's Very the cool. question. Yeah. I guess that's just a one-time use, and that's it. I would hope so. Well, the batteries are dead. So it's, therefore, it's one-time one use. When they, when they first use it, they put the ba the batteries in before No, no, this is a, a one-shot deal. The batteries in it, you just have to activate yeah, it. Yeah, it's not activated until, like I said, you take it, it's not activated for about an hour and a half. This thing senses that it's you know, getting out of the stomach because they can locate this. This is a locator because it's talking to each other with the harness. So when it knows it's out of the stomach, it goes. It turns it on. And then it, this thing is going through. And, you see, and everything in color, beautiful color. It's, ama it's amazing. Any other, any other uh, questions? I was just going to say, I have a pill cam in my collection of weird stuff, but I didn't know most of that detail. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting. Well, now you do. All right. Keep it. I, I. <laughs> and the quality of pictures that it provides is as good as it's all It's on. good. It's good. Yeah. The efficacy, a little technical term. The, they compared this with colonoscopy, and it was like 97% of a colonoscopy. It was, it was really good. Yeah. And like I say, you're just going to miss a little bit. But for somebody that doesn't want to have, like somebody sick, colonitis, col colitis, and they can't take procedures, they can't, they can't open them up, they're weak, it's all a pill. We'll take a look. Do we need preparation for this? Uh, not that I know of. You know, I mean, it's a big pill. I don't know. I don't know how she swallowed it, but she's got a big mouth. <laughs> if I remember correctly, it was years after they were using them in Israel before they were cleared for use yeah, in the yeah. States, which I can't imagine what would, what would hold something like that up. No, yeah, it did. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's unbelievable what comes out, right? Uh, the things we have, the things we can talk about, right? Um, nice to see everybody. Nice to see you, the Shaw. And Fred, nice to see you too. Okay, uh, we have a swap meet coming up, Hamfest. Uh, please be part of it. You know, and even if you're not vending, please come over and, uh, and see what we're all about. And uh, have a safe trip home. And uh, thanks for coming tonight. Okay, we'll see you next meeting. The meeting next meeting will be here in August.